this is Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Inter Arbor Solutions, and you're listening to Briefings Direct. The world's office workers now have more clout and influence than ever over where and how they do their jobs. Those who have worked from home and want to continue are spurring on their employers to do more than embrace hybrid work. They're seeking to reinvent the very nature of employment. Stay with us now as we explore new research into how such innovations as contingent labor exchanges and intelligent workspaces are changing the future of work forever. To learn more about how flexible work models are the new normal for workers and businesses alike, please join me now in welcoming our guests. We're here with Andrew Bartolini, founder and chief research officer at Arden Partners. Welcome, Andrew. Hey, Dana. Glad to be here with you today. We're glad to have you with us. Tim Minahan's here. He's the executive vice president of business strategy at Citrix. Hey, Tim. Hey, Dana. Glad to be back. Tim, COVID or no COVID, workers seem to have spoken adamantly when it comes to flexible work. What are they saying and why is flexible work here to stay? Yeah, Dana, you think about major historical moments throughout the ages that have really kind of reset how we live, how we work and the like. Certainly the pandemic will go out in history in one of those. And while none of us would ever wish the pandemic to occur again, if there's any kind of iota of a silver lining is is rapidly accelerated digital transformation and cause both employees and employers to dramatically rethink the way they work, where they work, how they work, and and who does the work. And we've been uh, studying this dynamic for for several years, both from an executive perspective, an IT perspective, and a knowledge worker perspective. And the the latest poll we we did, which was of 13,000 knowledge workers uh, around the globe, clearly indicated that folks are not going back to the office five days a week. They've proven that they can engage and be productive anywhere, and they're not going back. In fact, nearly 90% of those who participated in the poll said they plan to work on flexible models in the year ahead with the majority of them indicating that they plan to remain fully remote. Is the back and forth of how companies have been responding to this, and of course, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen in two weeks, never mind two months, but is this creating some confusion, some angst, and and is that contributing to what some people are calling the great revelation of why workers are seeking something new? Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a near-term part of it where even companies haven't quite, with the the latest Omicron uh, variant, right, haven't really figured out how do we get folks back safely in condition that's conducive to working. But more realistically, it's been the a major reset. We've talked about the great resignation, but there's also, you know, I heard it determined or defined differently as the great revelation. In fact, the similar study we did uh, of knowledge workers, 1,500 knowledge workers across North America, show that we've heard in stats that as many as 40 to 50 percent of workers in the U.S. have have left or plan to leave their jobs. And there's a number of different reasons, but really boils down to what I I would summarize as three things. Burnout, opt-out, and timeout. So from a burnout perspective, well over a third said they left their jobs because they're just burned out. They're stressed They're burned out by the stress of working in this prolonged pandemic environment, as well as the uh, over demands uh, in the workplace. And from a uh, opt out part, a lot of folks either took the time during the pandemic to retrain themselves to get new skills, or they just want a new challenge. And they're been looking at their, you know, been working at their employer for a while and they're looking for a promotion, or they literally just want to take on a a new challenge. And an interesting part of the study is a number of respondents said they, they ditched their jobs really to feel like they can get some control over their lives, which had you know, somewhat gotten out of control. And then the last one is, is timeout. And you think about the dynamics of the workforce. We often forget if we can think back, unfortunately, 48, 50 months ago, we had a global talent shortage. McKinsey was estimating that we had a shortage of 95 million medium to high skilled workers, especially those in the most in-demand skills needed to digitize and modernize your business like cloud, AI, security. And guess what? That hasn't gone away. So on the opt-out part, people have retrained and are trying to get into that. These are the dynamics that are really causing a, a complete reset of the workplace. So Andrew, it sure sounds like workers have learned a few lessons through this whole experiment of the last couple of years. What's working best for them when it comes to getting things done? And and how different is that from just two years ago? This has been a dramatic and radical shift and necessity is the mother of invention. And at the core, right? So people are resilient and they evolve, especially when they have to. There was no choice when we go back to March of 2020. 
20, but people found a way to keep working. Maybe they had an office, but more uh, home office, but more frequently people were working from their kitchen tables and from their, from their bedrooms. How workers and teams maintained productivity was amazing, but it wasn't necessarily easy. I remember, so part of what our, our research focuses on is, is the contingent workforce, but it's also the supply chain. And I remember speaking to the number two person in, for a Fortune 50 pharma company in a couple of weeks after the shutdown. And she was talking to me about how they were completely retooling several Asian factories to start manufacturing hand sanitizer, which they clearly saw a huge demand or future demand coming. We started to drill into the weeds there, and I was talking about the, the challenges of the global supply chain, and, and she paused and she said, the biggest challenge for us has been in dealing with the team working from home. This was sort of at the height of uncertainty around the risks of COVID-19 and, and the impact there. And, you know, as someone who's been generally virtual for more, working for virtually for about 20 years now, you almost forget, right, that, you know, I live in Boston, right? So Boston's rush hour traffic is terrible because most people work in the in an office environment and overnight that changed. And so I think in some ways, right, it's going to sound odd, but the pandemic, because it helped minimize distractions, right? You can't go to a movie, you can't go to a mall, helped people focus on the work at hand. And I think that the pandemic unified teams, right? I mean, people with children and pets and, and family responsibilities, right? When you bring the office into your home, you erase the lines between work and home life and things bleed into each other and, and particularly people with young kids at home. And so I think the reaction to that was that team leaders and and leaders of large organizations understood that they needed to instill greater levels of communication and collaboration. And really, as the leaders themselves, many, many CPOs, chief procurement officers that I spoke to talked about having much better scheduling and, and were, were actually interacting more with the, the people on their teams and their direct reports from a virtual environment than they had in the, the preceding years. So, you know, I think it's all part of having to learn and learn on the fly and I think by and large organizations were able to to sort of get through the challenging time and, and now settle into this period of, of greater uncertainty. Well, it seems like the workers get it. The workers have found how to be productive and gain balance in their whole lives pretty quickly. But employers seem to be still thinking we're going back to the nine to five in the cubicles thing. Are employers lagging in their perceptions? Why haven't they learned the same lessons of how this can work so well? I think there's always been a gap between the workers and, and their views and, and management, if you will. I don't think that the gap, at least in the research that we've done, it sounds like in the research that, that, that Tim Citrix has done, is necessarily related to the pandemic itself. When we were looking at sort of pre-pandemic, maybe about 21% of the workforce was remote. We're doing a, a study right now, and the early indications are that that maybe less, certainly less than 10%, maybe even less than 5% of all businesses plan to revert to operating in a post-pandemic way, you know, going back to the way things were, right? So doing that nine to five thing. So I think that the gap is a larger, more general run one, right? I mean, great resignation, great revelation right there. I think when you look at sort of the shift in power from employer to employee over the past couple of years, right? The McKinsey study that, that Tim just quoted, right? Being one great example that that we're really dealing with a market where there's this great resignation, plus a huge demand for talent, extremely low rates of unemployment. And we're really experiencing, you know, what we would call a talent revolution. And it's a revolution that's hitting workers of all types, right? It's hitting white collar and blue collar and the contingents as well. And their voice and, and what they're looking for from an employer, whether that's flexibility or there's sort of a greater alignment between the companies that you work for and, and the purpose that of those companies. There's strong demand for engagement with corporate culture. And this is really across the blended workforce, right? I mean, if you look at the blue collar workers seeking safer and better work conditions, Many of the things that are that are both sort of the intrinsic rewards, right? So better pay, better benefits, but also the extrinsic areas, you know, there's been that gap and employers have been slower to respond to that. But by necessity, again, they're going to need to start to craft engagement models and employment models that, you know, allow them to attract the best talent. And Tim, what do these employers need to do to close this gap functionally, even if they get it, even if they want to, what's missing from a lot of employers in terms of making the accommodations to keep their employees happy, productive, and flexible? At this point in time, the, the, the savvy employers recognize that this is, this is an opportunity to drive greater innovation, to recruit and retain the best skill set. If uh, in a lot of the same tactics they did out of necessity during the pandemic, 
allowing people to work more flexibly and, and remotely, arming them with more effective productivity and collaboration tools, being able to rethink their workforce strategies where before they had to compete with folks down the street in a major metropolitan area like San Francisco, New York, et cetera, they can now hire the best talent by uh, empowering the work wherever they want. And I think the three things that, that we always guide our customers to is when you think about what does this post-pandemic world of work look like? There's really kind of three categories. One is the, the one that we've talked about and that you hear about in the press, which is kind of where work gets done. But it, it's much more uh, transcendent than just does Sam or Susie come back into the office three days a week, five days a week, or, or not at all. It really is about how do I create uh, and maybe even rethink the role that the office plays? How do we create a work environment and a, and a tool set that allows employees to perform the different work types they do in the best way possible, right? When they're doing kind of thoughtful, meaningful research and other work, you know, maybe it's better for them to be remote. Maybe it's better for them to come together when it you know, comes time for kind of brainstorming, planning, strategic planning, that type of thing. And then you begin to look at your kind of real estate footprint. Gee, do we have a big office in a major metropolitan area? Or do we downscale and do we transform that office from one where everyone goes into the office, punches their virtual clock and closes the door or to be much more of a collaboration space where they come together for very discrete moments and activities or a customer experience space where they can invest more in those high traffic metropolitan areas in creating an engaging experience like you might experience at an Apple store. So that's the where. Then there's the who, right? And smart companies recognize that they can use what they learned through the pandemic around remote work to go out and recruit new talent in other areas, right? They're not beholden to a uh, commuting distance to one of their office hubs, right? And uh, also thinking about rebalancing the workforce where they might not be able to secure that developer or designer when competing with Amazon or Google on a full-time basis. There's a whole host of very skilled and talented freelance workers and free agents who have that skill that are willing to uh, and interested in taking the projects that they want. So you can get the top talent. And then the last part is the how, how they work. And this is a discussion you and I've had before, right? Over over the several past few decades, we've amassed a massive amount of tech debt. We've uh, deployed a whole host of individual devices and applications that in their own right were on their own were designed to solve a particular business process, whether that's uh, automating the procurement process, right, Andrew, or something else. However, when you stack them all on top of each other, they've become there's a cacophony of technology now that disrupts an employee's day. So having a digital workspace that allows an employee to have access to all the work resources they need in a very secure way, no matter where work gets done, but layering it with kind of automation and productivity and collaboration tools that allow them to work at their best, more efficient work execution and collaboration across all of these systems so that they're not just being disrupted throughout the day, but they're actually can quickly get work done, quickly find the information they need and do their best, most meaningful work. Well, Andrew, um, Tim just laid out some, some interesting things around where and who and how, but the who kind of jumps out at me. And it seems to me that a full-time employee isn't the only option. You don't always need to know where they are, but maybe you don't need a full-time employee for every type of process or productivity. So what is the future of work exchange and how should we think about the types of labor categories differently while we're looking, re-examining everything else at the same time? I think Tim's exactly right. And, and I think your, your question is absolutely on point. So the Future of Work Exchange, the website that Arden Partners launched actually only last year, we've been tracking the growth and expansion of the contingent workforce for the past 13 years, right? So since, since the start of that, and, and they've really focused on, you know, what we, we define as the future of work. And, and we think about that as the strategic optimization of how work gets done through the evolution of talent engagement, the advent of new technology and innovative tools and the transformation of business standards. And the reason why we've, I guess, invested greater resources in this area is because the, the growth and expansion of the contingent workforce, right, the extended workforce, it's called a lot of different things today, has grown dramatically over the past decade, right? So our research shows that 47% of all workers working for a company today are not full-time employees. They're contingent workers, they're the independent contractors and consultants, right? So almost half, half of all workers. A decade ago, that number was 25%. And we expect that number to climb above 50%. I, we expect there's probably a natural ceiling 
that will be hit at some point in a world where talent continues to be a major differentiator. But as organizations start to think about really more, more focused on the how work gets done than necessarily the who, there's been a shift. We've erased many of the geographic constraints that, that companies have traditionally had when trying to staff projects and to find the best talent. That's been removed by technology, the advent of digital marketplaces where people can find the talent and do matching. And there's been a shift in the way that organizations are thinking about what it is that they need to do to get their projects done, to get their work done. And it's moved from sort of the old view of the contingent worker was the temp, right? Somebody's going on vacation, somebody's going out on maternity leave, we need to find somebody to fill a tactical position. The expansion and expanded view of who we can bring in to do work and, and what that work is, right? So much more strategic projects is really just a, an evolving mindset that has been accelerated by the pandemic. So it's, it's really a very interesting and exciting time for those working in procurement and those working in HR to get their hands around what does their total workforce look like as they go forward. So, Tim, Arden Partner says almost half the workforce is no longer full-time. That means when they start working for a company, they're not onboarded in the same way. They don't get, here's your 15 applications, here's your laptop. You have now uh, 45 different sign-on to deal with, but you need to do that on a more granular basis, maybe focused on a process or a project, not an employee definition. How can the technology support this uh, interesting new mix of types of workers when it comes to getting things done? You're absolutely right. And that is something that companies had to uh, grapple with throughout the pandemic. I'm thinking of some of our financial services customers that saw a dramatic, as you might expect, uptick in their financial advisory services, remote financial advisory services. And you know, one was telling me that they, they hired 3,000 new employees during the pandemic. And to your point, they needed to onboard them all remotely. They needed to get them technology very quickly. They needed to get them access to the applications and information they needed. And that was where they kind of really embraced secure digital workspace strategy, leveraging, in this case, our desktop as a service offerings to be able to quickly send out, uh, stand up a, uh, a desktop that had their their work, the personalized workspace for that employee. In some cases, they would send out a, a thin client device, like a Chromebook, to allow that employee to have access to a device. Or in other cases, at least early on throughout the pandemic, they would allow them to use their home device. But because they had a, uh, you know, a virtual desktop as a service offering, they were able to ensure that not only did that employee have reliable access to all the onboarding materials, all the applications, all the training, all the information they needed, but that it was delivered in a reliable and very secure way. So they could uh, ensure that their corporate information remained secure. And this is offering a, a whole new flexibility, particularly as we look at who does the work. As we've transitioned virtual desktop delivery from on-premise to the cloud, it's opened up and made desktop delivery much more turnkey and much more practical for a broader, broader set of use cases, right? So not just full-time employees, but contingent workers, seasonal workers, temp labor, these freelancers that we've talked about, designers and the like. And it's allowed them to stand up and empower and onboard these employees very quickly without putting their kind of corporate resources at work. One great example of this actually is a customer, an innovation partner of ours, Major League Baseball, which throughout the pandemic, as we all saw in full spotlight, you know, had to uh, grapple with how do they put the season on? How do they keep the players safe, the employees safe? How do they uh, empower them? But at the same time, we're seeing, uh, as, as the rest of us were, a rising incidence of uh, cybersecurity threats. And they were able to not just empower this employee base with desktop services, but also their supply chain. A lot of their supply chain partners are small partners who they were stepping up their security requirements and they just didn't have a large IT department or the like. And Major League Baseball basically extended this desktop service to that supply chain so that they could be compliant, continue to deliver the high grade of innovative and quality services that Major League Baseball needed while meeting the, uh, the stepped up security requirements. And so I, I think we're going to see a massive shift if, if we believe that flexible work is here to stay. The only consistent place that an employee works is going to be their digital workspace. So, Andrew, sometimes I think we get complacent about how important a role this technology is playing in allowing this all to happen. And one of the ways for me to, to wrap my head around how 
essential and really innovative and, and powerful that technology is, is to say, well, what if this pandemic hit 10 or even 15 years ago? And it could have happened any time. If this had happened 10 or 15 years ago and we didn't have cloud computing, we didn't have desktop as a service, and virtualization was just starting out, where would we have been? It seems to me that we, we lucked out, right? We got just over the line on where this technology is capable that has allowed almost anywhere in the planet people to work remotely. This technology is almost, I think, underappreciated. I would say no doubt, right? I mean, there's been a long, steady, you know, march towards driving improved communication, whether that's among teams and, and the ability to chat or really among trading partners as well. That's another uh, piece of the aspect, right? I mean, if you think about the, the growth of the global supply chain, I mean, that's been a technology enabled phenomenon as much as anything else. But when it comes to the workers and, and to the workforce, if this was 10 or 15 years ago, I'd like to think that we would have seen many of today's innovations come along much sooner. But from a, a workforce management standpoint, when you're dealing with a workforce that that is not full time, that is much more transient in how it engages uh, and and how you engage. Your approach to that workforce necessarily has to change, right? And from a technology standpoint, if you have your your old HR playbook of how you on, onboard a traditional employee, you need that same playbook now for the for the freelancers, for the temps, and you need to have those things codified and smooth because there's a you know a war for talent that's going on right now, and so it's not just the full time employees that are picking and choosing when and how they engage. It's the independence as well, right? It is this extended workforce. And so you as an organization have to be at the ready. You have to be the employer of choice, whether that's a, a short-term project or sort of the long-term employer of still the 50% of the workforce. So yes, it's uh, technology has been absolutely critical and is only going to play a greater role, right? When I speak to procurement or procurement leaders, chief procurement officers and directors of sourcing, right? There's been a shift that is has happened and is going to happen, right? As you see offices and the investment in corporate real estate shrink, they're redeploying that money to productivity tools, to technology that can create the, the digital workspaces that Tim's just been talking about. So there is this transition and the technology has played a key role. Absolutely. And Tim, we talked a little earlier about employers needing to close the gap between recognizing a flexible workforce future. It seems to me that this has forced them to appreciate how impactful the technology can be. And in many ways, we're only scratching the surface of what the technology is capable of. So is the silver lining here that we've created a catalyst to technology adoption and therefore also a catalyst to further technology development? Yeah, Dana, I think the combination of certainly the pandemic has accelerated everything as, as folks are looking at accelerating their digital transformation, the shift to you know more flexible work models. And that is causing companies to think not just about how do I deliver all the work resources, all the applications, all the content, all the collaboration tools that my employees need to be productive and do it so securely so they can work anywhere, but also looking at gee, how do I help them work better? And so there's been a, if you look at any of the uh, analyst studies out there, topping the list of prioritized investments for IT this, this year are collaboration tools, you know, tools that foster more efficient work execution and collaboration across these distributed work environments. And some of that are, are actual tools like whiteboarding tools, like project management tools. And some of them are actually this whole role in RPA or automation, really providing a, uh, a way for frontline business analysts and business users to knit together all of the source systems to complete a single business process so that employees can actually not be burdened by technology, but can, can actually drive differentiated business processes. And I think that's a key opportunity as companies are looking at, gee, a lot of the stuff I invested in out of necessity during the pandemic is now allowing me to drive new business processes and innovation in my business that I couldn't think through before. But all of this, I should note, needs to be company, accompanied by changes in, in, in policy and ultimately culture, right? So if you think about our experience during the pandemic, including on this, this podcast here, whether we're using Zoom or Teams or whatever, it was really the great equalizer. 
And we all have the same size box. We all have the same access to the same tools, the same information. But as we roll, rotate back to you know what a lot of folks are trying to work out is hybrid work opens up the opportunity to create a high level of inequity in the workplace where you have these battles between the office first culture and the remote culture. And you know, how do you run meetings? And- we used to call road warriors, remember? Exactly. And right. And it's a big shift that we need to talk about. How do you create equity in the workplace? So no matter, you know, you just assume that you're going to have a meeting, a planning meeting, a work environment where you're going to have remote workers and in the office workers. How do you create that equality? So I know as we talk about this hybrid work model, companies you know, are really have an opportunity now to figure it out. I know that here at Citrix ourselves, we're, for example, retrofitting all of our com- conference rooms to be hybrid oriented. We've got cameras now in the middle of the table. We're operating on teams wherever we do a meeting. We've got cameras on the whiteboard and we're trying to develop protocols or policies that remote people participating in a meeting, for example, get to respond or ask the first questions, those types of things which you haven't really thought through need to be thought through in addition to the technology infrastructure that enables it. And so, Andrew, uh, companies right now are sort of dealing with some really tough, thorny problems around flexible work models and also the talent shortage. What is your research telling you about what they should do sooner than later in terms of how to best uh, adjust to this? What is the research telling you are sort of the the fast track things that people should be doing to be best prepared for a strategic approach to these problems. I think that one, the new flexible work model, the the extended or, or contingent workforce and its growth in size and in strategic impact really has changed the way that organizations need to engage talent, right? So if you're a hiring manager, if you lead a large organization, your need to be in hiring, you know, hiring is now a 24-7, 365 day uh, activity, right? Because workers' duration and the amount of time that they're staying with a, a single employee has also dramatically shortened, right? And so you need to be developing and building a talent pipeline and maintaining that pipeline in you know in an ongoing fashion. You need to be working to become the employer of choice. And you know the research that we've seen, right, and, and the strategies that organizations are you know should be employing if they haven't already. You know there needs to be a more empathetic approach to how you manage your people. The workforce today, because of the labor shortage, you know, the sort of low unemployment and the and the and the high demand for talent, has allowed them to spend more time seeking out the jobs and the employers that that match with their own sensibilities. Right? Is there a purpose that the the company can communicate to their candidates and and to their current workers? What is the culture of the organization, and how how is that culture sort of manifested when you're dealing with people that are distributed and not meeting face to face? How are you thinking about the benefits and, and how are you trying to better understand what it is that your workers need from a, from a flexibility standpoint? And so I think all of those things sort of go back to how do you engage your talent, right? And so that's the, the talent that you're, you're trying to recruit to bring into your organization and the talent that you have now that you're trying to retain. A similar question to you, Tim, as companies are grappling with flexible work and talent shortage issues that are critical, what does Citrix's research and your your product development efforts tell you that they should be doing now tactically in order to also be set up strategically for this cultural shift as, as, as we've termed it? I think we, we, we touched on this before. I mean, the number one thing, if you look at it, 90% of employees plan to uh, use a flexible work model this year, 80% pr- prefer to uh, continue on in that fashion. And so companies need to really think about their workforce strategies in different ways. They need to be uh, open to flexible work arrangements in order to secure the top talent and the modern skills that they need, but also to uh, retain their existing talent who are increasingly looking for new opportunities in this in, in this hot job market. Secondly, they need to create an environment you know, from a technology standpoint that is conducive to allowing employees to do their best work. You know, before, if everyone was coming into the office, your technology investment was pretty systematic. You know, now, as you look to uh, what is it going to take to empower an employee to work from their own device while protecting corporate resources, 
while ensuring that they have the collaboration, communication, and productivity tools that they need to uh, foster more efficient work execution and collaboration across this distributed environment. And so those those are the types of things folks need to, to think about. But I go back to my previous discussion. They need to be coupled with a change in policy and culture, one that is forward thinking about, okay, if I have a new workforce strategy that is a balance between FTEs and contractors, to make sure we have the right skills on the right project and we're managing things in a much more pools of talent. What are the policies that we need to put in place to to make that most effective? If I know that my employees and assume that we're always going to be in a work environment now where we've got in-person and distributed folks participating in the same meeting, what am I doing to, to foster an environment that makes that a meaningful experience for everyone involved, not just those that are that are sitting in the room. Uh, and then finally, what am I doing culturally to ensure that development opportunities and career advancement opportunities are not hindered by the choice of where I work? There's a, a major reset, like I said before, that companies need to think through. And that's in order to be competitive, to be able to secure the top talent Retain the top talent and drive and modernize your business we, you know, with this talent, you, you need to adjust on those three vectors. Well, Tim, I really respect the amount of research that you're doing there at Citrix. You're being empirical and not gut instinct on this, and that's great. And you're also sharing this research. So where can people go to learn more? Where can they find some resources that Citrix is providing? I appreciate and uh, the feedback, Dana. You can go to citrix.com forward slash fieldwork, which is really where we uh, incorporate uh, and make our research available. We also have our own kind of remote works podcast there, www.citrix.com forward forward slash fieldwork. This is where you can find all of our research. Andrew, where can people learn more about Arden Partners, their research and the future of the of work exchange? If you go to futureofworkexchange.com, that's our site that's got all of our, our current research and innovative ideas and tools. Uh, Tim even has a few articles up on the site there too, which we appreciate it. Well, very good. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. You've been listening to a sponsored briefings direct discussion on ways workers and businesses alike are adopting flexible work models as the new normal. And we've learned how such innovations as contingent labor exchanges and intelligent workspaces are empowering workers to control their destiny and reward their employers with higher productivity. So a big thank you to our guests. We've been here with Andrew Bartolini, founder and chief research officer at Ardent Partners. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, It's been great, Dana. Thank you. And we're also been here with Tim Minahan, executive vice president of business strategy at Citrix. Thanks so much, Tim. Thank you, Dana. Appreciate the dialogue. And a big thank you to our audience as well for joining this Briefings Direct Future of Work Innovation discussion. I'm Dana Gardner, Principal Analyst at Interarbor Solutions, your host throughout this series of Citrix-sponsored interviews. Thanks again for listening. Please pass this along to your community and do come back next time.